Well, thanks for uh, coming tonight. Um, I am Robert Wright. I'm a visiting professor of science and religion here at Union Theological Seminary. Um, and uh, those of you who were here when I spoke last week know that my mission here at Union um, is to develop and articulate a worldview that is spiritual, um, but is totally compatible with science and even informed by science. Um, so it's a worldview that doesn't depend on any claims of special revelation, or doesn't appeal to scriptural authority. It's a worldview, uh, you know, that you don't have to take my faith, take on faith in principle. I can argue for it, um, and that's what I'm doing uh, in the course of these five talks, that this, of which this is the second. Um, I'm kind of laying out elements of my, my worldview and, and uh, arguing for them. Um, now, when I say that I'm developing this worldview, that's a little bit misleading, because actually I've kind of had this worldview uh, for a while. I mean, it's been my de facto worldview, but I've never really put it together and tried to kind of argue that it's a coherent uh, package or that it makes any sense. And I don't really know if it does make any sense to anyone else, and, and that's one reason I welcome the kind of feedback uh, that I get um, in the question and answer sessions after these things. Um, and tonight, uh, we actually have two rounds of feedback. We have a special guest, uh, Paul Bloom, well-known psychologist uh, at Yale and public intellectual. Um, he's uh, been kind enough to, uh, to come down from New Haven uh, and will be unkind enough to ask me witheringly challenging questions um, after, after my talk, before the Q&A. Uh, now, spiritual world, world views can have a lot of elements. There are a lot of elements that are more or less typical. Um, they tend to provide uh, some source of inspiration, hope, uh, consolation, um, moral orientation. Uh, often, a spiritual worldview will have a kind of a cosmic narrative. You know, they will situate the human experience in a kind of sweeping vision of history uh, that, that may help orient the person morally or may, may even infuse them with a sense of purpose. And uh, these kinds of elements and others I will be talking about uh, in the coming talks, but tonight I'm going to focus on another thing that spiritual worldviews often do, which is have kind of a theory of badness, an explanation of why bad things happen, and some ideas about what to do about that to reduce the number of bad things, um, and often some corresponding moral guidance. Okay, um, now I'm, I'm not talking here, uh, so I, I am going to talk about evil, but I'm not talking about the so-called problem of evil, which gets particular discussion in, in the Christian tradition. In other words, I'm not, gonna, I'm not asking why would an omnipotent and benevolent God permit suffering to happen, um, because, uh, you know, for one thing, my, my worldview does not presuppose uh, that there is a, a benevolent and omnipotent God. Um, I, I actually will, in the fifth lecture, talk about some conceptions of God that are consistent with my worldview, and maybe even, in some, to some extent, suggested by my worldview. But my worldview does not uh, assert the existence of uh, any God. So, in what sense am I going to talk about evil? Well, I think there are two main ways that, um, that evil gets talked about. Uh, one that is the most common these days, I think, is, is it's used to just mean very, very bad, right? Like Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs is evil, very, very bad. People who decapitate people on videotape are evil. So it's just kind of a degree of moral condemnation, the ultimate degree of moral condemnation. Um, but there's, you know, another traditionally, in spiritual traditions, there's been another uh, sense of the term evil, which is in a kind of explanatory sense, okay? It isn't, it, the question is, why do individual people do bad things? So in some uh, spiritual traditions, you might get an answer like they are inhabited by evil spirits. Um, in other traditions, you might get uh, something more monachean, the idea that there is a, a, a cosmic global struggle uh, between the forces of good and evil, perhaps conceived as metaphysical substances um, or something. Uh, but in, in any event, the goal uh, is to, to explain why evil things happen. Now, these kinds of traditional conceptions of evil obviously don't fit very handily um, into a scientific worldview. You know, you, you, evil spirits, 
posited metaphysical substances. Those are, these are not the way um, scientists talk. Uh, and one thing I want to do tonight, in fact, the main thing I want to do tonight, uh, is ask, um, is there a kind of a, you might say, scientifically respectable way of talking about evil? A conception of evil that does some of the explanatory work that, that conceptions of evil have done explains uh, why a lot of bad things happen, um, but is, uh, is consistent with a scientific uh, worldview. And this isn't just an academic question. I actually hope to, to shed light on why a lot of the bad stuff happening around the world is happening. Um, so our story begins with uh, the axis of evil. Most of you, uh, many of you at least, look old enough to remember George Bush's axis of evil speech about Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. I'm old enough to have actually written about it. I wrote a piece uh, in Slate about it. And uh, I treated this idea of, of the axis of evil about as dismissively as you would expect someone of my uh, ideological orientation to treat it. And I, in fact, drew a rebuke from the influential uh, conservative blogger Instapundit. Uh, he, he said that my piece was, I think, um, quote, both, both dumb and snide. Um, and believe it or not, that's not what most offended me. He also said, I think that what makes people, people being me, cringe about good evil discussions is that if you admit that good and evil exist, that creates obligations to oppose evil and to support and be good. That's work and it involves responsibility. So now he was accusing me of uh, not just being dumb and snide, but lazy and irresponsible. So I decided he had gone too far. And I emailed him and I said, you know, in, in, in kind of dismissing this Bush's conception of evil, I didn't mean to, to say that there are no morally bad things in the world. I'm, I'm not denying the existence of moral truth, but I took Bush to be speaking in a kind of monarch Kean sense of evil. You know, the idea that maybe behind all of uh, the bad acts in the world, there's, there's an underlying metaphysical substance, and that's what uh, inhabits the, uh, the leader of, of Iraq or North Korea or whatever. Um, you know, so in this conception of evil, the word doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean bad, it kind of represents a grand unified theory of bad, okay? An, an attempt to explain something that is said to be able to explain uh, all of the badness in, in the world. Um, and to Instapundit's credit, his name is Glenn Reynolds, he wrote a follow-up post in which he, he, he modified his uh, critique in keeping with my email. Um, but you know, in thinking about that, I started realizing that the idea of evil in the sense that I meant it was actually kind of appealing, right? If there's a single thing underlying all the bad things in the world, then you know where to, uh, to focus your, your energies in combating it, right? Um, you know, it's like uh, in Lord of the Rings. I mean, I'm not a Lord of the Rings guy, but I gather. There's Sauron is the, the, the evil person, and, and, and Mordor is Sardon's headquarters or whatever, so you, you focus your attack on the headquarters, right? There, you've got this one clear goal. You know, it wasn't easy, uh, but uh, it's, at least it's a clear mission. So I started wondering, um, if you dispensed with the idea of a supernatural force, metaphysical substance, could you still come up with something that, that you thought was responsible, kind of a grand unified theory of bad, something, some human tendency or something that was responsible for all the bad things in the world? Or, since the answer to that is surely no, what's the closest you could come? Okay, what is the single thing that's responsible for uh, more bad things than any other uh, single thing? You know, what is a, what is a kind of a, a uh, you know, within a scientific worldview, what could you uh, call a grand unified theory of bad. Well, um, my own candidate for that uh, honor, I guess, is uh, the failure to put yourself in the shoes of other people, particularly when that's very hard to do. Now, <clears throat> there's two senses in which you can mean put your, yourself in the shoes of other people. First of all, there's emotional empathy, that's the most familiar sense of the term empathy, you know, feeling their pain. Um, and I do mean to include that because, you know, emotional empathy is, can be very important. It tends to be associated with acknowledging the moral worth of people, 
And of course, a lot of uh, bad has been done by people who didn't acknowledge the moral worth of people or groups. Um, and so I, I do, you know, I, I think that kind of empathy is important. But I'm mainly going to focus tonight on a second sense of empathy, sometimes called cognitive empathy, because I think its importance is really underrated. And cognitive empathy is just putting yourself in the shoes of other people in the sense of just understanding what's going on inside their head, how the world looks to them. You may not feel their pain, you may not like them, but you do the thought experiment and try to understand um, how the world looks um, from inside their head. Uh, so, this, you know, this isn't always hard to do, this exercise. Uh, but sometimes it is, and when it is hard to do, I call it moral imagination, okay? Because you have to work, you have to use your imagination to, to put yourself in the shoes of someone. It doesn't happen naturally. Now, the term moral imagination has been used in various ways. Um, again, I like to, 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 to use it for, to mean putting yourself in the shoes of other people, and that's particularly challenging. It may be challenging for a number of reasons. It may just be that, that they, the person is in circumstances very different from the ones you're familiar with. Um, and it may be for some other reasons that will come to that you have trouble uh, uh, exercising moral imagination. But I do think it's important to exercise it in the hardest cases um, because that's when I think it can do the most good. So <clears throat> this brings us back to the axis of evil. Uh, Iraq, uh, of course, was one of the countries in the, in the um, axis of evil. And, uh, you know, uh, you may recall that there was a run-up to, to the war, and then we, we went to war. And one thing you didn't, uh, there was a lot of discussion about invading Iraq before we actually did it, but one thing you didn't much hear was, you know, hey, can we stop and just look at things from Saddam Hussein's perspective? You know, I, don't, I, didn't, I, I didn't hear that, and I was, I was definitely paying attention. Um, and I think that actually, uh, if we had done that, we might have saved ourselves um, some trouble. And here's what I mean by that. So just to recap, we invaded ostensibly because we thought that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, a whole program, including some actual weapons. Now, he was letting uh, United Nations inspectors uh, inspect any facility they wanted to inspect. OK, so you might ask, well, why did we invade then? Um, and part of the answer is that he did, he did offer some resistance around the edges, okay? So for example, we wanted to take his scientists out of the country and interrogate them, and he said, uh, no, no way. Um, and we concluded, well, it must mean he's got weapons of mass destruction. After all, why else would he refuse to let us take his scientists? Well, actually, if you think about it and put yourself in his shoes, you can imagine all kinds of reasons, I mean, in theory. Uh, maybe he was afraid they would defect, and they had other forms of valuable knowledge. I think maybe most plausibly, he didn't want to be any more humiliated in the face of his people than was necessary to avoid war. He'd already let these UN inspectors in, which was a major concession. Um, there's a common uh, misconception about dictators that they actually don't care what their people think of them. Actually, they care, I think, more than democratically elected leaders, and uh, with good reason. Um, because a lot of their people are not, not happy with them. In any event, there's all kinds of reasons that, that he could not, that he could resist on this particular point. But anyway, we assumed the worst. We didn't exercise moral imagination. We had the war. It had all these consequences. It created ISIS, which is now, you know, the, the, the thing um, most called uh, evil. Okay, so why is moral imagination, putting yourself in the shoes of, of another person, why is it so hard? Well, as I said, sometimes it's just that you're not familiar with their kind of circumstances. Most of us don't have any experience being brutal dictators, so that makes it kind of challenging to imagine being Saddam Hussein. Um, but there are other reasons uh, that I think are, are often more important, and these have to do with so-called cognitive biases, uh, which uh, have gotten a lot of attention in psychology lately. You've probably heard of the confirmation bias, where uh, you know, you, you only notice evidence consistent with your position. You don't notice evidence that's inconsistent with it. A little of that may, may have been going on here. Um, in the case of Saddam Hussein, a little confirmation bias. But there's another uh, cognitive bias that I think hasn't gotten nearly the attention it deserves, and I think it may uh, be implicated as well. It's called an attribution error. Now, originally, 
uh, this was called the fundamental attribution error, and the conception of it was that it worked like this, okay? It was, it was a tendency in evaluating people's behavior to attribute too much significance to their disposition, the kind of person they are, and not enough to circumstances, situational factors. So, for example, uh, if you're in a drugstore, you're at the checkout counter, someone's rude to the clerk, you think, that's a bad person. That's the normal reaction, that's a bad person. But more often than you might think, uh, that's not typical behavior for them. They just had a bad day, or maybe the clerk was rude and you didn't see that. But anyway, there, there, there was thought to be a general tendency to underestimate situational influences on people's behavior. Now, it turned out, as more work got done, that actually it's a little more complicated than that. And whether you commit an attribution error uh, depends on, and, and the nature of the attribution error, depends on who the person is that you're evaluating, what their relationship is to you, um, and what kind of thing they've done. So the way it works is that with friends and allies, uh, we are more likely, if they do something good, we tend to attribute that to disposition, to the kind of person they are. Whereas if they do something bad, we tend to explain that away with reference to circumstance. So we, maybe they did something under peer group pressure or something, but it wasn't the true them doing it. That's friends and allies. With, with uh, rivals and enemies, it's exactly the opposite. So if they do something bad, well, that's the real them. That's dispositional, because they are, after all, bad people. There are enemies or rivals. You expect them to do bad things. If they do something good, then people are more likely to explain that uh, in terms of, of situational forces. Maybe they were just doing something good under pressure or, uh, or, or to kind of show off or, or whatever. Anyway, it's not, uh, it's not the real them. Okay, so to get back to Saddam Hussein, you know, he had been very clearly defined as the enemy, so when he did this bad thing, uh, you know, uh, to, to not, not uh, submit to our demands and let his uh, scientists leave the country, it was bad by our definition, um, you know, we didn't, since he was an enemy, there wasn't a natural inclination to go look for situational explanations. Maybe he's just doing this because of X, Y, or Z. That was not the inclination. The natural human inclination in a situation like that it's just to say, well, that's par for the course. He's a bad guy. He does bad things. Okay, so I think that may have something to do. This is very conjectural, but I think that may have something to do um, with, uh, with our, our failure to kind of, uh, you know, or the, the quickness with which we, we jump to conclusions uh, in, in that case. Um, because he had been defined as the enemy. Now, um, if you ask why had he been defined as the enemy, well, partly because he had done things inimical to the interests of the U.S. It wasn't a crazy designation, uh, but it's also true that people who wanted to have a war had gone to great pains to define him as the, the enemy in the most extreme terms possible. Um, and in light of this attribution error, uh, I think you can see why it's an effective strategy to depict, if you want a war, to depict the leader as the enemy as decisively as possible. Because given the attribution error, it's harder for them to get out of that box once they're in it. And, and a, um, a, a social scientist named uh, Herbert Kelman has written about this. He writes, thus, attribution mechanisms promote confirmation of the original enemy image. Hostile actions by the enemy are attributed dispositionally and thus provide further evidence of the enemy's inherently aggressive, implacable character. Conciliatory actions are explained away as reactions to situational forces, as tactical maneuvers, responses to external pressure, or temporary adjustments to a position of weakness, and therefore require no revision of the original um, enemy image. Now, I'm not denying Saddam Hussein was a bad guy. In fact, I chose him because he was a bad guy, because my premise is that even with bad people, it can be valuable to uh, exercise moral imagination. I could list a lot of not great people I would apply that to. I mean, Vladimir Putin is a not great person. Uh, I personally think if we had done a better job before the whole Ukraine mess of understanding what his perception was about uh, his country's vital interests, uh, we probably could have found a solution that was better for all concerned than the solution we wound up for and wouldn't have, wouldn't have involved any, any abject appeasement. I won't get into the scenario, but that at least is my view. 
Uh, and one thing this illustrates is that moral imagination can often be useful in solving non-zero-sum problems. In other words, when there's a potential for a win-win outcome or a lose-lose outcome, um, they can help the exercise of moral imagination, understanding the other person's perspective, can help steer you to the, uh, the win-win outcome. Now, um, the people I would like to extend moral imagination to are not confined to world leaders. So, for example, uh, young Muslims in Europe, in the United States, who may feel somewhat alienated, be on the verge of alienation, um, I would like to understand what's going in their head better. I, would, I think it would be productive for more Americans to put their se themselves in their shoes because then we might have a clearer understanding of things we might do that would make them less or more alienated. Obviously, more alienated is uh, bad news, as we've seen. Um, there's a particular example of this. It's a little bit of a hobby horse of mine. Um, so you remember the attacks on the offices of Charlie Hebdo in Paris. Um, now, after the attacks, uh, you know, you may remember a lot of people marched through the streets of Paris with signs uh, saying, I am Charlie Hebdo, you know, just we Charlie. People were saying that on Twitter. And, you know, I understood what they meant. What they meant was something that, that I would mean, that I embrace, which is, uh, you know, freedom of speech should be a fundamental value. You shouldn't be killed. Uh, for saying anything, even if I personally find what you said, uh, you know, reprehensible, you, you just shouldn't be killed. I think that's what people meant by, you know, I am Charlie Hebdo. But, you know, if you put yourself in the shoes of, say, a French Muslim, um, you know, remember Charlie Hebdo had had uh, drawn, uh, had, had published a number of cartoons that were not implausibly perceived as extremely insulting to the Prophet Muhammad. So if you're, if you're uh, a Muslim, you may well, when you see somebody saying, I am Charlie Hebdo, you may jump to the conclusion uh, pretty naturally that they are embracing the actual content of that magazine. That's a, a, you know, a not surprising misreading uh, of the message. Um, and I think if you're sending messages, uh, you know, you should try to send them clearly. And, and, and obviously the audience I'm talking about uh, Muslims in, in Paris and elsewhere, that's a really important audience for, for these people. I mean, they, their goal presumably is to decrease the number of violent attacks like this. So it would be good to know um, what, what effect that message has. And, and if you think it's too ambiguous, then just say it another way that's clearer. Now, so far this may sound like a, like a left-wing message, the, the implications of moral imagination as I'm framing it, but I actually think it should be applied, you know, symmetrically. Um, so, for example, um, you know, with Israel-Palestine, yes, I, I wish that more Israelis appreciated what it's like to live under occupation with, with basic human rights like due process uh, denied and so on. I also think it would be good if more Palestinians understood that on the Israeli side, there is, uh, there is genuine fear. And, 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 and that motivates, uh, I think, more uh, Israeli behavior than some people appreciate. Now, of course, if you're in Gaza, you're saying, like, fear. Are you kidding? I mean, your chances of, uh, uh, if you're Gazan, if you're a Palestinian in Gaza, your chances of being killed by an Israeli are higher by, I don't know how many orders of magnitude, than the chances of an Israeli being killed uh, by somebody in Gaza. But, you know, fear is a funny thing. I mean, uh, Americans, in my view, wildly overreact to terrorism uh, and succumb to, to fear. Uh, I mean, after 9-11, we invaded two countries, not one. Um, and I think we've overreacted to a lot of these things. It seems to be kind of human nature. And, and, and I think, you know, understanding that uh, is, uh, can be good. So similarly, um, you know, I have spent a lot of time saying to people, uh, I doubt, you know, saying to white people, I doubt you and I appreciate what it's like to be a young African American and, and have a pretty good suspicion that uh, a cop is looking at you differently than he's looking at uh, a white guy your age, um, or a store security guard or whatever, um, and I think that's very important. I've tried to, you know, convince people to do that. But I also think it's important to extend uh, moral imagination to cops, you know? Uh, what's going on in, in their head? There again, I think sometimes more often than we might imagine, um, fear plays a role in behavior that, that might seem just purely malicious. In any event, whatever the answer, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, uh, 
I think I say apply moral imagination all across the board. Yes, I wish Trump supporters would ask, what's it like to be an immigrant? But I think it's worth, ask, worth asking, like, why do these people support Trump? What's, what's going on in their head? I mean, after all, they're human beings. They're probably, in some sense, reacting to things in accordance with human nature. It's probably um, comprehensible. Uh, and so on, you know, sexual orientation. Yes, I wish some conservatives would, would say, I wonder what it would be like to be born gay or to be trans. But I think it's also worth asking, you know, I wonder what it's like to be the evangelical mother in Oklahoma who's homeschooling her children for fear of contact with modern values. What exactly uh, is the nature of the fear? Um, and so on. So I favor the, uh, the radical and symmetrical extension of moral imagination. And one reason I call it radical is, is if you go around doing this and say, let's look at things from the point of view of all these people, you will get a ton of blowback, okay? That's one of the signs that you're saying something radical, is people will complain. And a lot of times the reason they'll complain um, is that they are equa they're equating explanation with exoneration, okay? They're saying that if you want to just explain why someone did something, then you are in some sense sympathizing or, or, or saying that they are not to blame. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can separate the question of explanation um, from the question of blame. But there is a strong human tendency, and I think this may be kind of built into our brains, to equate the two. So brace yourselves if you're going to go around doing this. Um, I personally, uh, because of an op-ed I wrote in the New York Times, was accused of, quote, sympathizing with terrorists. Um, the good news is that the person who accused me was Ann Coulter. And, you know, if you're, if you're going to get accused of some high crime, I say, uh, make it Ann Coulter. <laughs> um, so when I attribute a lot of the badness in the world to uh, a lack of moral imagination, in a way what I'm saying, I'm attributing it to kind of the, the lack of a scientific attitude. Because, after all, a scientific attitude is, you know, give me any phenomenon, and I want to explain it as fully as possible. If Saddam Hussein is res resisting our demands, I want to know what perceptions and thoughts and feelings are driving that reaction, and ideally, um, I'd like to know what, in turn, caused those uh, perceptions. But in any event, uh, you know, I, I, I want to know. That's, that's science, the search for the most complete answer possible. And I think moral imagination is the search for answers. Why are these people acting like this? So um, evil, in my sense of the term, could be described uh, not just as the absence of, of moral imagination, but as a kind of absence, um, a, a kind of absence of scientific spirit. And note that um, this is roughly this conception of evil is roughly the opposite of some of these ancient conceptions of evil that, that I alluded to, because after all, if you're saying uh, evil is some kind of supernatural force that inhabits people, then what you're saying is there's really no cause in the material world, so it's not really a scientific question like why the person is doing the bad thing. That is just not amenable um, to, to scientific analysis, according to these kind of ancient conceptions of evil as, you know, supernatural force, uh, metaphysical substance, um, in contrast, evil, in my sense of the term, uh, presupposes that there is uh, a scientific explanation, and indeed I'm saying that evil is in some sense a failure to uh, appreciate the explanation or pursue the, the uh, explanation. Um, and by the way, here there's a, an historical footnote. I've been using uh, an ancient historical footnote. I've been using the term uh, Manichaean kind of just generically to refer to a kind of a, you know, a dualistic a, 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 a cosmically dualistic worldview. But Manichaeism was an actual articulated worldview in the ancient world. Um, and I'm not an expert in it, so there's a chance that what I'm about to say is just wrong. But my impression is two things that are kind of interesting. Um, St. Augustine uh, wrestled with, flirted with Manichaeism, but then uh, famously rejected it. And my understanding is that the way he came out on the question of evil was, he said, no, evil isn't like a thing. When bad stuff happens, what, what there is is just the absence of good. It isn't the presence of evil, it's the absence of good, or something like that, he said. Now, I can't totally wrap my mind around that, to be honest. Uh, you know, what absence of good, what would, you know. But, um, but I am saying something kind of comparable in a certain sense that 
that, uh, that, that a lot of badness, at least, results from the absence of something, the absence of moral imagination, the absence of an attempt to actually um, understand the world. Uh, the other interesting thing uh, and relevant thing about uh, Monichaeism is that uh, the idea, as I understand it again, in uh, Monichaeism, you know, I, I, I mean, again, I'm saying that, that, uh, that, that what ultimately, uh, you know, conquers evil is understanding things better and better, more and more knowledge. Turns out this was in some sense the view of Monichaeism. The idea was that the ultimate conquest of evil would come through knowledge. So uh, good was associated with knowledge, evil was associated with ignorance, so that, at least at a broad level, is kind of um, consistent with my worldview. So, um, you know, three cheers for Manny. Uh, Manny is the, the guy who actually articulated uh, Manichaeism. M-A-N-I, not M-A-N-N-Y. Um, so, as I said last week when I spoke, you know, I see this spiritual worldview of mine as... as um, as uh, residing in a space I called the new agnosticism. It's not the same as the new agnosticism, it's not the label for my worldview, but I, I see it as kind of uh, residing within a larger territory I call the new agnosticism, and in defining the new agnosticism I, I contrasted it with two things. First of all, the old agnosticism of the 19th century, I said that, you know, agnosticism has always been about intellectual humility, about recognizing that if you aren't certain about something, whether there's a God or not a God, you shouldn't say you're certain about it. It's always been about intellectual humility and, and a reluctance to make unwarranted, reach unwarranted conclusions. And I argued that actually, ironically, since then, science had given us more reason for intellectual humility, not less, partly because of all the weirdness about fundamental questions unearthed by physics, you know, and the suggestion that the human mind will just never get to the bottom of these ultimate questions, partly because, ironically, uh, behavioral science, I said, had actually crystallized uh, the mystery of consciousness more clearly than it had been crystallized before. But in any event, I said there's more grounds for intellectual uh, humility uh, now than there were 150 years ago. Um, the other thing I contrasted the, the new agnosticism with is the new atheism. Uh, as some of you who are here know, and, and probably most of you who weren't here know roughly what the new atheism is. Um, because, as I said, the new atheists, first of all, are kind of known for, many of them at least known for not being very intellectually uh, humble. That's, that's one contrast. But, but also they, dis, they disagree. Uh, they, their views contrast with my views, my spiritual views in, in other senses, so they make good foils. Um, I spent a lot of time using them as foils last time. I'm not going to do that. You may be happy to hear. But there is one, one theme from last week, one new atheist theme that I promised to revisit, uh, and I am going to revisit it because I think it is illuminated uh, by what I've just said about the, the attribution error. Okay, so this was uh, when Sam Harris, uh, perhaps the seminal new atheist, um, was... Uh, looking at possible causes of terrorist behavior, and he listed them, you know, Israeli occupation of the West Bank, collusion of Western powers with dictatorships, endemic poverty, lack of economic opportunity, he listed all these, and then he dismissed them in the following way. He said, but I will argue that we can ignore all of these things or treat them only to place them safely on the shelf because the world is filled with poor, uneducated, and exploited peoples who do not commit acts of terrorism, indeed who would never commit terrorism of the sort that has become so commonplace among Muslims. Now, as I pointed out last week, that's just a fallacy. That's exactly like saying smoking couldn't cause lung cancer because the world is full of people who smoke and don't get lung cancer. Uh, or it's actually like saying Sam, something Sam definitely wouldn't like. Religion couldn't be the cause of terrorism. Islam couldn't be the cause of terrorism because the world is full of religious people and Muslims who don't commit terrorism. Um, there's one thing I would add now in light of this attribution error, which is that I think um, it's actually quite plausible, I don't know, but uh, that if you ask why would somebody, you know, in a book, in, in, this is his magnum opus, The End of Faith, in a presumably well-considered book, commit a fallacy this uh, kind of glaring, um, it could well be an instance of the, the attribution error. I mean, remember, you know, Sam presumably thinks of terrorists, not irrationally, as the enemy. Um, and if you're thinking of them as the enemy and, and the, the kind of attribution error colors your thinking, 
then you're going to tend to dismiss situational explanations of their behavior because uh, you, you know, you, part of you wants to think that they are just, uh, j just locate all badness within the person as, as part of their character. That's a natural thing to do. It's certainly possible that that's what was going on here. Um, in any event, the second thing I'd say about this is, although Sam isn't using the word evil here, um, his view is in some ways the functional equivalent of the kind of old-fashioned supernatural view of evil, right? I mean, remember there the view is that you are possessed by this evil, it's unconnected to the physical world, no explanation. Well, you know, Sam imagines these people being inhabited by malicious religious belief and at least in this passage uh, seems to basically rule out uh, all possible environmental explanations of it. Uh, I mean, at least you could use the kind of logic he's using to dismiss any posited situational environmental um, cause. So, you know, I, I'm sure if I ask him this, he'd have an answer and he'd argue that no, I explain beliefs in X, Y, and Z way. But it seems to me there's a tendency here not to want to explain them in, uh, in kind of scientific terms. I mean, unless he's going to say, well, it's all like in the genes. They're just genetically defective or something. I mean, because he does, he does seem to be ruling out uh, environmental explanations just by the structure um, of his logic. Um, in any event, leave aside uh, whether, whether uh, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, his view is the functional equivalent of, of, of uh, you know, a supernatural conception of evil. Um, it's certainly, I would say, not, not a very scientific uh, attitude. The scientific attitude aims to explain things as fully as possible. It wants to ask, like, why do some people have a belligerent interpretation of their scripture, whereas others don't? Um, and in contrast, I would say the new agnosticism, as I conceive it, is more infused with a scientific spirit. And in that sense, um, my emphasis on moral imagination. It's kind of natural that it's part of a, a worldview that I, that I uh, locate within, the, um, within the, uh, the new agnostic space. Okay, so that's, uh, that's my attempt to come up with a grand unified theory of bad. If I had to use the word evil uh, in a modern way, that's the way I would do it. The truth is, though, I would just assume that we drop the word evil altogether because, let's face it, I'm not going to convince the world to, uh, to use evil the way I use it. Um, they're going to continue to use it the way they do. And the connotations of the word evil, um, you know, I said at the outset that, that one thing it means to people is just very, very, very bad. But often when they use it that way, they also mean something else. They kind of mean beyond the reach of scientific explanation. They mean it's just incomprehensibly bad. It's just, you just can't imagine what would possess a person. So it has, it has some of that ancient connotation to it, I think, uh, the word evil, beyond scientific explanation. And as you can probably tell, I don't think that's um, a very uh, productive view to say that there's no point in asking what's going on inside of the heads of people who do uh, bad things. So. You know, I just think the word evil, the way it's used, short circuits moral, moral imagination. So you might say that evil as the word is used is evil in my sense of the word. So, I don't know, the, but, but, you know, if you say it's evil to use the word evil, then you're, you get drawn into this, uh, you, you collapse in paradox. So I would just as soon skip the word. Um, but I stand by my position uh, that lack of moral imagination is uh, a huge problem. Okay, so let me just get back to... Uh, what I said at the outset, um, that uh, this, this exploration of evil was in the service of uh, fleshing out a, a spiritual worldview. Um, so again, spiritual worldviews often have uh, theories about why bad things happen um, and corresponding moral guidance. My moral guidance is exercise moral imagination. That's like a central pillar of my worldview. Uh, another Another uh, feature of spiritual worldviews, and I alluded to this last time, is often the idea that in our ordinary consciousness, our ordinary way of looking at the world, there's something incomplete or misleading. Okay, so Buddhists say we live in a world of delusion. St. Paul said, you know, being in this world is like looking through a glass darkly, but, you know, when uh, salvation comes or liberation comes, depending on the terminology of your religion, things will be clearer. Well, 
there is, you know, in my view, very much the idea that ordinary consciousness is not reliable. And I think this is backed up by psychology's growing documentation of cognitive biases and, more deeply, uh, by the argument from evolutionary psychology that the human mind was designed to get genes into the next generation. If that means seeing things clearly, fine. That's what we will do. And, and, and sometimes the mind does see things clearly. But if delusion will help you get genes into the next generation, or our ancestors get genes in the next generation, then delusion um, there will uh, be. Um, and it's important to appreciate how subtle these biases can be, you know. Um, as I've said, I think, you know, one way of looking at some of the, the biggest problem with the world today, in a different sense, is, uh, you know, the psychology of tribalism. Whether it's religious, nationalistic, ideological tribalism of the kind we're seeing in America. And consistently, this, 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 uh, this at, the psychology of tribalism is sustained by these cognitive biases. And just to illustrate how subtle some of them are, I mean, when you think of uh, tribal psychology, you may think of, like, rage. But, you know, rage, you know when it's happened, right? I mean, when you're seized by rage, you may not be thinking, I'm enraged. But the next day, most people will go, well, that was rage, right? Whereas, if you look at the cognitive biases that are involved in getting you so morally indignant and convinced of your own rightness that you get into a moralistic rage, including the attribution error, you could go your whole life without being aware of that bias, right? I mean, it's just not, it just so subtly infiltrates our evaluations of people that we're just not aware of it. And um, I think that's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's one, this is one reason, the subtlety of these biases is one reason that I think sometimes it takes an actual spiritual discipline to make much progress against them. Uh, my own favorite spiritual discipline is meditation. I think, uh, you know, I have a daily practice, I go to retreats, uh, and I think some, particularly some variants of meditation are, are very good at getting you to understand your mind better and understanding what's actually going on in it. Um, and I guess I should admit at this point that, you know, a certain amount of my uh, spiritual worldview is Eastern in, in nature. Uh, I'm pretty taken by uh, not just the potential of meditation, by certain parts of Buddhist philosophy and psychology. Um, but there's another sense in which uh, my worldview is kind of Western. Um, you know, I said that uh, often spiritual worldviews have a kind of a cosmic narrative, a view of, of history. Um, and the Western versions of those in particular tend to be kind of linear and often apocalyptic. You know, the Abrahamic versions of, of these, of these, uh, these uh, historical um, narratives. And I have a little of that um, in me. You know, I, I do think that, uh, that technological evolution in particular has kind of impelled humans uh, to higher and higher levels of social organization, so getting to this point of globalization was very likely, uh, and so too was the kind of moral threshold it puts us on, where either we uh, cohere as a global community or things may spiral downward. Um, and next week, uh, I'm going to elaborate on all that, and next week uh, my, uh, my interrogator uh, the person doing the work that Paul Bloom is doing this week will be John Horgan, the famously contentious science writer who's guaranteed to provide at least as much uh, pushback as I want. Um, so before we bring Paul up, one final point about spiritual worldviews. There is often in them an element of self-help, right? I mean, they promise to make people happier uh, and healthier. Um, and I actually think moral imagination could do a little of that, uh, seeing things from other people's point of view. Um, precisely because it can help uh, help you play non-zero-sum games, can make relations better at work, can make, uh, I think, a marriage uh, uh, more harmonious, and, and so on. Um, so, so it can pay off in terms of immediate self-interest. Um, at the same time, uh, one thing that I think makes uh, moral imagination qualify as a spiritual exercise is that it involves the recognition that it's, it's not just about you and that getting out of your your perspective, getting out of your natural vantage point, uh, can bring a literally truer uh, view of the world and certainly a more constructive view. Thank you. Um, so Paul, by way of introduction, I'm sure a lot of you know Paul. Um, you can you can you can proceed. This is this is so informal that I'm not going to. We, we're not waiting for the introduction to build to a crescendo before you walk on amid thunderous applause. Um, 
I need like the final countdown, that sort of thing. <laughs> okay, three, two, one, zero, yeah. we're here. Um, so Paul, anyway, uh, very well known, writes regularly for the Atlantic. Uh, among his books are uh, How Pleasure Works, Just Babies. By the way, just is a pun there. It's about early, the early development of moral intuition. So don't complain that there's stuff in the book other than babies. It doesn't mean just babies. Take that, Amazon reviewers. Right. Amazon reviewers have been known to complain that there are things in the book other than babies. Um, but, uh, and Paul's done, you know, important, we, we share broadly the perspective of evolutionary psychology. Uh, so in that sense, we're on the same page. But Paul has lately been articulating some views about empathy, uh, suggesting that it is uh, uh, sometimes not a great thing, and I, I think that may be in some sense true. I'm not sure how much we disagree about that, but in any event, why don't you, why don't you uh, take it, say anything you want about me, and ask anything. So I've, I've, I'm very grateful to have been invited here, and I'm supposed to sort of provide conflict and, and you know, get, get Bob to spell out his views, but I'm going to go off script just for a minute and just say how much I admire um, his work in general, and in particular sort of project he's taking on here. So, so if, if you've read his books, and you should, um, you, you'll see this sort of relentless, careful scientific project trying to provide robust causal explanations for all sorts of aspects of human behavior, informed by the best psychology, by neuroscience, and particularly by evolutionary theory. And in this regard, I think he's equal to the very best to do this, people who I admire very much, like Steve Pinker or Jared Diamond. But in addition, Bob has his more spiritual side, that, that is, is um, where there's a sort of anxiety about the overconfidence he sees in some other intellectual projects. There's a desire and an interest in a more transcendent, uh, finding a transcendence in this work. And, and it makes, and, and I, I, there's nobody like that. There's nobody who would give a talk like he just gave, and I think that that's just terrific. Okay, thank you. You can go now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've got a feeling that whatever comes yeah, next yeah, is not going to be on the... On yeah, the... You, you wish. Um, um, so, you, your talk is about the moral imagination. You started by correctly, and we'll go back to this, correctly saying, you know, there's something which Roy Baumeister has called the myth of pure evil. And this is the idea that, uh, that what evil is is this spirit, this amorphous thing that, that maybe is mystical, and some people are just got it, and there's nothing you do about it, and they're totally different from us. Well, it turns out that across every study you look at, evil people are, for the most part, us. They're just how other people see us, see, see you when, when your interests clash. The Israelis think the Palestinians are evil, the Palestinians think the Israelis are evil. Um, they, they've done, Baumeister's done interview studies where he looks at people in conflict. And he looks at people who, who have done something bad to somebody else. And if you've done something bad to somebody else, and you're asked, describe what you did, you say, well, it was pretty small, I didn't mean it, I didn't intend, I felt very bad afterwards. And then you ask people instead, describe when somebody's done something bad to you. And you'll say, man, it was just this, this bastard just for the pure kicks of it, did this horrible thing, doesn't seem to be forgiving at all, and you get this radical difference. And so, so you need to unpack it and realize that if you want to understand evil, you should sort of basically look at ourselves. Now, so this is my, here's, I'm leading up to my first question, which is um, the, the conclusion you seem to want us to take away from this, or one conclusion is that lack of moral imagination is a major cause of evil, maybe the cause of evil. But interestingly, you never actually make that argument. So I would have thought you'd say, well, take ISIS, or Saddam Hussein, or Hitler, or somebody will all view as evil. Let's look at different candidate explanations for why they're, they're evil, and we're going to discover its lack of moral imagination. It's going to rise to the top. But instead, what you argue, I think tremendously convincingly, is that moral imagination, perspective taking, is a great thing to have. It would have helped us avoid unnecessary wars. It will help us deal with conflicts. It will help us, us, us meet our enemies and, and, and best them or convert them or make them, make them not our enemies anymore to ally ourselves with our friends. And that's a really good case to make. But the other case, that evil is caused by lack of moral imagination, it isn't an argument I saw you making, and I actually find it implausible as a psychologist. So there are studies, for instance, of bullies. And you might think, um, because people are supposed to think this, that bullies are people with pure social skills. Bullies actually test very high 
on social skills. Bullies are very good, in particular, at figuring out what goes on in the heads of other people. That's what makes them good bullies. Um, the people who are bad at, um, at, at perspective taking and social skills, those are the victims of bullies. Um, psychopaths are a variegated group, but some psychopaths are actually really good at what you call moral imagination. Because in order to con somebody of their life savings or seduce somebody or trick somebody, you've got to get into their heads, feel what they want, what they know, where they're coming from. And I don't doubt, so I don't doubt that Vladimir Putin and Saddam Hussein and Adolf Hitler were pretty good at sussing out what's going on in the heads of their enemies because they were incredibly successful at carrying out their evil projects. And so for this reason, I'm, I'm skeptical that moral imagination is the magic bullet you think it is. Okay. Uh, first of all, a technical point. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that lack of moral imagination explains evil. As a technical matter, I'm defining evil in the modern sense as the thing that explains more bad than anything else. So the lack of moral ima imagination is evil by virtue of that. Yeah. I, I generally want to would, would just dispense with the word evil, but that's a little bit of a distinction. Um, and you're right, I haven't uh, compellingly you know, gone through history and made the case. Um, and I'm sure there are uh, counterexamples. Again, the claim isn't that it underlies all bad or that all bad would be, uh, would be removed if we were better at it. But I would say, I mean, you brought up ISIS. Well, uh, as I said, if we had avoided the Iraq war, I don't think ISIS would be here. But, but more than that, I think throughout the war on terror, there has been a consistent, well, there's been a consistent tendency to respond to terrorism with exactly the thing that makes the problem worse. Yeah. And uh, that, involve, that includes invading um, Iraq. It, it includes, uh, to my mind, uh, many more drone strikes than are a good idea. I think we've, um, you know, as far as the surveillance of mosques, uh, who knows whether they're going overboard, but I think there's been lack of appreciation, lack of discussion. But there's just clearly a downside. If, if, if people who already feel marginalized and alienated uh, start feeling that they are being subjected to persecution. There's a real downside. So I think the discussion, the war on terror has consistently lacked adequate evaluation of what's going on in the minds of the people that you are worried about becoming terrorists. And I think as a result of that, it's become this positive feedback system where in response to terror, we do something that makes the terror worse and on and on and on. So that's at least a view. I mean, again, I, I haven't uh, you know, there, there are specific examples there I'd cite. I, I, even, even making that argument, uh, you know, persuasively would take a while. But you, you brought up ISIS, so that's what I would say um, about, about ISIS. Um, I find it utterly convincing. Right. It's just there's two questions that are somewhat separate. One question is how should we deal with ISIS? Suppose you want to kill them all. Mm -hmm. Well, in your plan, so get in their heads. What do they want? What are they planning? What would hurt them the most? What would, totally agree. Suppose we want to, you know, if you have a goal in mind involving people, whether it's a good goal or a bad goal, getting in their heads is a superb way to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's question, and I'm convinced of that. But the second question is, what makes ISIS ISIS? Or the Ku Klux Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, or whatever, any evil group that we characterize evil, what makes them what they are? And to me, it seems like, I don't doubt that, that the members of ISIS are poor at perspective taking. But, but that seems, but it seems. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not saying that they, I think they do actually lack moral imagination. I don't, it's not so much the, the technical ability to do perspective taking, um, but for example, they are misreading us just as we are, are misreading some of them, or, or, or we are misreading people who might join ISIS. I mean, they, they take, uh, well, like J. Sui Charlie. As I said, it wasn't a well-designed message. At the same time, it was misunderstood. There wasn't an adequate job done, I think. Uh, I doubt an adequate job was done by everyone on the other side of understanding what was meant. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the things that we do that are taken to mean we are at war with Islam do not actually mean that. So if they did understand our actual motivations better, those motivations, those, those actions would not be as incendiary. So I actually do think um, there, there probably is a failure of moral imagination there. At the same time, I'm not saying that everyone who does something bad, that person lacks moral imagination, and that's the problem. As you said, uh, psychopaths, not the problem. In fact, moral imagination may help them work, do their work more efficiently. Now, I was aware of that, and I kind of tried to fudge by at least mentioning this capacity for um, 
uh, you know, emotional empathy. And I think in non-psychopaths, I, I, I would guess, it's an interesting question, that there's a, uh, a kind of symmetrically interactive relationship between, I would guess that if you're not a psychopath, successful perspective taking makes you more prone to emotional empathy with a person. And by the same token, I certainly think emotional empathy facilitates perspective taking. I think that's the reason that we're better, we do it automatically with like family members and close friends, uh, whereas not so much with enemies. But I'm, I'm not, again, you know, I, in the end, there is no grand unified theory. My claim is, and I haven't even, you know, <laughs> studied this exhaustively enough to convince myself, my claim is that if you could change one human tendency that would do the most good, it would be, uh, it would be th this, this ability, uh, or the, often the lack of ability, to just understand the perspective of the other uh, person. Um, it's an interesting yeah. claim. I, you know, I should say, I was once listening to a radio show. It turned out, I think it was the guy who wrote one of these books like Getting to Yes or something. Anyway, it was, it was like one of these, you know, negotiation books about how to negotiate non-zero-sum situations. I came into it halfway, I didn't know who it was, but I heard them talking about game theory and, then, and, the, and the radio uh, announcer said, what do you think is the biggest problem in the world? And I just knew it just popped into my head. I know they're going to say the failure of people to understand the perspective of others. And that's exactly what this person said. And whoever this person was is actually a credentialed expert, unlike me. So I, in the end, I'm using authority. I, I, I appeal to authority. Not scriptural authority, but professional authority. I'm kind of an expert myself in a few things. Well, not, I, not, I'll, I'll, not I won't really, get in the way really. uh, between the, the fight between you and the, and the guy on the radio. So, so. And I'm, trying, I'm trying to frame this in terms of a question, but I just disagree. So I'll just say this. Um, you do these studies where they give people all these tests, and they look at how well they do on the psychological tests. And they, they see how this relates to aggression. So it's a huge analysis looking at empathy and physical aggression, sexual aggression, and verbal aggression. Everything from prison populations to uh, people in retirement communities, the whole shebang. And the relationship is zero. There's like no correlation. Wait, there's a correlation between what and what? Between, between lack of empathy and propensity to, to, to commit aggressive acts. Lack of emotional empathy. Lack of, they, did, they looked at every sort of empathy. And they found okay. that the correlations here are incredibly low. Do you know what does, so this is a different view here, what does predict violence? If I had to do one, if I had to give you people one test to figure out who's the most likely to kill me, um, it would be self-control. And this, is a diff this speaks to a different model of what's going on. Would you view it as a friendly amendation to your theory that it's not so much dialing up the, pers the ability to take others' perspective, but dialing up the significance, the moral significance you give to other people? Um, well, you know, again, I'm not, um, I'm not arguing that, you know, in the everyday world, people who do bad things are, are uh, are lacking in empathy. I mean, I mean, it kind of gets to what your your own critique of empathy, yeah. I think, is that um, you know uh, a normal human being has plenty of empathy for like people in their family, yep. people in their tribe. Nazi soldiers had empathy with one another, presumably, and so on. And this is kind of your argument, right? Yep. So, first of all, I want to emphasize <clears throat> on that. On the test, I wouldn't expect uh, to find in that sense a, a, a like generic correlation um, between capacity for empathy in the ordinary human sense and whether or not you do good things. I mean, from my point of view, the whole problem with empathy, and I think from yours, is that people tend to use it in the ordinary human sense. Yeah. My tri people in my tribe deserve sympathy and I can understand their perspective. And this is one reason I made a point of defining moral imagination as, as, as uh, extending cognitive empathy in those cases where it's most challenging, right? Because that's when yeah. it will do uh, the most good. And, and I, I doubt the people who commit these crimes are, are deploying their empathy when it's the most challenging, like when they're about to stab somebody. I doubt they're going, you know, they're paralyzed by empathy, right? Yeah. And, and that's, my, that's my problem. I, I want people to extend empathy 
uh, mainly cognitive empathy, but both across tribal lines, so to speak. That's the challenging part. That's the not natural part. So I am for the non-natural deployment of empathy. So let me, let me give an example which fits from your point of view and then go a different place with it. Um, I was watching the Republican primaries on the debates, not this round, but the last round, uh, four years ago. And, um, and the issue of 9-11 came up. And Santorum, very conservative, uh, was saying, this is, you know, they hate our freedom, it's monstrous, it's, a, it's an inexplicable act of evil that must be snuffed out. You know, picture perfect the argument, the, the thing you're arguing against. Then Ron Paul, and this was an unusual debate, stood and say, said something I wouldn't imagine Democrats would have the guts to say, which is that, you know, you gotta, you gotta but think about the motivations for why these people did that. You have to put this in a context. How would you feel if in your nation bombs were dropping, killing children, killing people, wouldn't you want to rise up and attack the people doing it? it did not go over well. But, <laughs> but, so, but, but he, was, he, was, he was channeling his, his, his inner Robert Wright and, and extending the moral. And you see where it got him politically, right? <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, but, but here's one reason to worry about it if you're a politician or if you're, if, even if you're a moralist, which is in some way you said it's not true that to explain is to excuse. That, that it is possible to understand what's going on in somebody yeah. and, and still blame them morally. But I would submit it's harder. It's hard. It is hard. It's harder because if, if, if you convince me that, um, that, that other nations view Obama's drone attacks exactly the same way we see 9-11, and, but I don't think Obama's a moral monster. I don't, when I start thinking that way, it causes me to question my, it starts me to erode my moral passion. Right. And I guess you might think that's just a good thing. No, I mean, I think uh, this is, it is a danger. I, I mean, I think, again, people naturally, they have the intuition apparently, and I think this is, will ultimately have a clear uh, kind of, explanation in terms of evolutionary psychology, I suspect it, it's engineered into the brain by natural selection. Our intuition that if you can explain people's behavior fully, they are not morally responsible for it. That's a strong intuition, and you're right that that's a danger. And people have worried about this in other contexts that, you know, uh, it, once we understand fully the relationship between serotonin and violence, we won't be able to lock people up. First of all, that hasn't been a problem, actually, yeah. in the criminal court system. Not a raging problem that we're reluctant to lock people up, even though the, science, the brain science has advanced more and more. Um, but what I would say is, if, if it's a problem, um, well, first I should step back and say my own view is that punishment is actually always, in a sense, regrettable. Um, and, 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 and an enlightened person would always punish with regret, just as a practical necessity. Um, and... And I kind of think that, you know, if I'm right, and to kind of save the world, so to speak, we're going to have to get better at deploying moral imagination, be unafraid to explain bad behavior, then we are also going to have to get better at separating the question of culpability, or at least punishability, you know, from the question of explanation. That may be another challenge facing uh, humanity, as I, uh, as I suspect it is. Um, a philosopher I know, Owen Flanagan, has a book coming out on anger, and he talks about a, a, a dialogue he had with the Dalai Lama, where you get to ask the Dalai Lama like one question, and uh, his question was great. He asked, you know, would you kill Hitler? Would you have killed Hitler if it would have ended? And so the Dalai Lama is very excited. He translates and he's talking to his advisors, and the answer was, yes, I would, but I would do with a lot of ceremony, and I wouldn't be angry at him. Right. And, and it's very, and, and the sense is it's, it's regrettable. Killing somebody, punishing somebody is regrettable. Yeah. You're better off not doing it. You shouldn't get, you should view it in some way as like a surgical procedure to make the world right. better. And it's it's fun, funny, this is kind of related. Um, once I was on a meditation retreat, and you get into this state of mind that's just different. From, and I remember, um, now, strictly speaking, you're not supposed to kill even bugs on a retreat. Uh, uh, let me admit right off the bat, I broke that rule. Um, because there was a mosquito on my arm, and I, I remember breaking the rule, but I remember being struck by how different it was in that frame of mind. I had no panic, no alarm, no ill will toward the mosquito, but I just understood that, you know, they can carry disease and so on, it's yeah. gross that they're sucking your blood, you know, um, whatever. It, it, it was, I mean, this sounds trivial, but um, 
that, that, that separation from kind of, uh, of, you know, rage and retribution from uh, punishment is, is, I think, you know, a necessary, is an important thing and may, may be more important as we, as we go along. Um, so that, that brings to a sort of general concern people could have about your program, which is, is asking too much. And, and I think, and I want to sort of go back to moral imagination in that regard. Um, Steve Pinker, in, in his book, Better Angels of Our Nature, talks about the decline of violence. And there's a part where he says, he talks about uh, the injunction to love thy neighbor, and then also then love thy enemy. And he says, I don't love my neighbor. I certainly don't love my enemy. But I don't think you should kill them. Rather, I have a notion of human rights and human respect mm. that doesn't require an emotional bond or emotional tie. And I think, so the argument here against the force of the moral imagination is an end amount, a degree of humility, which is that I, am, I, I, am, I don't think I'm capable of actually imagining what it's like to be a black teenager harassed by the police. And I don't think I'm available, I, I'm, I'm, I'm able to do it cognitively. I mean, it's too different from my own life. Let alone somebody in the Sudan or somebody in ISIS who was my enemy. So it's too hard. And also, even if I could do it cognitively, emotionally, I'm not going to care for some stranger as much as I care for my child that, or, or a member of my tribe. Again, that's asking too much. And so the alternative is you have sort of more abstract systems of laws and human rights, and you don't actually go through all the, the, the craziness of trying to put yourself in other people's shoes. Well, right, but I mean, if, no, if nobody's... I mean, I would argue that putting yourself in other people's shoes is what leads to a robust, a robust system of, of civil liberty and equality under the law in the first place. And if, and, and if you know, we became more and more deficient at that, some of this would uh, tend to um, collapse. I mean, I mean look, uh, you know, right now we have proposals to ban Muslims from coming into the country and so on. So these threats are always under challenge, and I can certainly imagine cases where if more people were better at moral imagination, there would not be these recommendations. Um, so, I, you know, but again, I, I think part of it is I am... I, I didn't make a huge deal of emotional empathy. I'm not asking Steve yeah. Pinker to love everybody, but, but I think doing the intellectual work of understanding and explanation uh, when it's the hardest is, is in a way what, what leads to the kind of society he's saying he would like to live in. Just focusing on cognitive empathy, if you could take people who are now we view as evil, engaged in, in mm. bad projects. Mm. Is your view that if you could turn up their cognitive empathy, turn up their dial of understanding of others, it would make them better people? No, again, it's not, um, it's not and we should, we should open this up yeah. soon because they may uh, have questions for me or you, but um, it's not mainly, the argument is not mainly that bad people who do bad things do them because they lack moral imagination. That's not it. It's that when people uh, threaten, may wind up doing things that would be bad for you and may be bad for them and bad for everybody, uh, it, it, exercising, you're exercising moral imagination. Yeah. Make it, so the Putin case, um, you know, uh, it, it's like Ukraine was, he considered it within his sphere of influence. He even had a naval base in Crimea. When we have comparable situations, a country, America, a country close to them that we consider within our sphere of influence, especially if we have a military base, of course we would stage a coup. We've done it again and again and again under much less, uh, much less compelling circumstances. We do it all the time, okay? So, so now, now if you had said, so you know, actually there's a chance that this guy will do kind of what we do all the time, then, 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 you, might have, then you might have done something uh, like this. The European Union might have said, Okay, to, join the, to get the trade benefits of, of being in the European, Ukraine does not have to leave the Soviet trade bloc, which is one thing Putin found um, so, so threatening. Okay, um, that kind of thing might have saved everybody a lot of trouble, but the relatively few people who are talking that way, like Steve Cohen, got like vilified for being commie sympathizers or something happens all the time. So I, I'm, you know, 
I am to no small extent actually thinking about geopolitics. I mean, if you just look at the various miscalculations that got us where we are today, okay, and, and then I will stop and, and we'll open it up, but, but um, you know, the original intervention in Afghanistan, the decision uh, under Jimmy Carter and then Reagan to turn Afghanistan into a proxy war and arm uh, the Afghans, which again was taken out of way excessive fear of what the Soviet Union might do of us if they, if they retained possession of a country right on their border anyway. Um, that, I think, that led to both, both the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. That's a twofer, okay. It's just a simple miscalculation, a misestimation of what the various players would do. Um, and then again, because it led to Al-Qaeda, it led to the Iraq War, which led to ISIS, you know. Uh, the, the, we repeatedly do things at the surely geopolitical level that involves just a failure to predict how, what the various players are going to do just as human beings, that has come back to haunt us again and again. So, so would it be fair to say that you're not offering a unified theory of where evil comes from, but a unified theory of how to deal with evil? Well, I think, no, to some extent, to the same, I, I'm just limiting how unified I think it is. Again, it's not, I'm not, it's not a grand unified theory. Uh, I, it's, the, it's the closest I think I can come. And, 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 but it, I, do think, I do mean it both diagnostically and prescriptively, yeah. Okay. Okay, so, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I probably mark you against moral empathy, but it seems to me that what you're saying is more... I, I wouldn't argue against moral empathy. I think it's a good thing. But it seems to me that what you're saying ignores the fact that people who are morally empathetic can do incredibly immoral things as a result. And uh, I tend to agree with your uh, view that we probably should ban the word evil and not apply it to either cognitive states or, um, mm -hmm. or to you know, people's characters and so on and focus on whether what an individual does is, whether his action, not his character, not his thought, his cognitive state or anything else is moral or immoral. Um, you know, to take the concrete examples. I, I mean, I think there are very few people who actually would, who do evil things who would actually say that they're not being right. empathetic. I mean, take mm -hmm. your neocon who gets you into Iraq or uh, Afghanistan or whatever. I'm sure that person feels that he's being completely empathetic, or many of them do, think that they're being completely empathetic uh, you know, with the people over there, they want mm. freedom, they, you know, mm. um, doing... Take, but you know, they're not. The but, the but, but you know what? You know what? Um, Neocons tend to be very bad at this, actually. They, they consistently describe the politics within Iran in a way that is totally detached from the reality of the situation show no appreciation of the internal politics within Iran and the corresponding pressures that leaders are under. I'm not saying they don't think they're good at it. I'm saying they're not good at it, okay? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not arguing for thinking you're a good person. The biggest problem in the world is that everybody thinks they're a good person. No, I, I'm, I'm arguing for the actual deployment of moral imagination. I them all in a single basket, but I think some of them think they aren't being morally empathetic. They do. They do think that. Actions, but the other thing is, is I, okay. But the, but the other thing I'd, I'd say is what I said to Paul. Certainly, empathy leads to a lot of bad behavior. A famous Texas cheerleader mom, you know, she emphasized with her daughter, who was uh, trying out for cheerleader, and she really wanted her to get that slot. So she plotted to have the mother of her daughter's rival killed. That's going too far with empathy. But that's, a, you know, an extreme case of a natural deployment of empathy in the sense that it was directed against a, toward a family member. What I'm in favor of is, is, so to speak, the unnatural deployment of empathy a, 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 to other families, to other tribes, and, and but, so on. So. But even that, so the, the <laughs> contemporary politician now who uses empathy the most to further his goals is Donald Trump. So if you, if you look at Donald Trump's anti-immigration speeches, they're never, oh, awful hatred. It's not just that. What, in every speech, there's, there's discussion, and Ann Coulter does this too in her book, which I bought. I feel bad about that. Um, um, which is they talk about, about the victims of illegal immigrants, right. people who are raped, children who are killed, right. innocent people who are killed. Donald Trump talks about Kate all the time. Who's Kate? Just a first name. 
because it's a woman in, uh, in California who was murdered by an undocumented immigrant. And he extends the moral imagination trying to get you, I mean, not, I, I don't mean to be, to be dismissive, but in a way to get you to feel sympathy for somebody and hence feel anger towards a competing group. So it's a tool that could be okay, used but what, in different ways. What kind of, pers you know, I mean, who's, Whose perspective is he actually illuminating there? This is, this is more emotional. Empathy. Okay, it's that's, not, it's not, not, that's not my emphasis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other, um, maybe right there, Philip. And, uh. Hi, thank you. Um, given what was said about, um, what you said about humans just not having the capacity to sustain moral imagination, um, and given the context of a globalized world and the amount of um, cultures and religions that we have potentially clashing, I'm wondering what you see as our tools or institutions or um, structures that we have in place in society that would have the potential for people to um, institute this moral imagination. It's a good question. I mean, uh, is, is this for... I, I, I guess this is for you, and this is keeping in mind the, con <clears throat> the evolutionary context mm -hmm. of humans, which is that we, we just do not have the ability to take care of as many yeah. people as we are currently responsible for in our globalized world. So, so I, 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 just to, to frame this, I totally agree with the importance of putting ourselves, seeing, seeing where other people are coming from. It's, it's good if we want to help them, it's good if we want to kill them. It's just, it's just, it's in some way, it's a form of, inte social intelligence is a form of intelligence. And like any intelligence, it's a tremendously valuable tool. I'd rather be smart than dumb. Um, I'd rather have my enemies be dumb than smart, which gets the, which is, which is, is my worry. My, when I was talking about limitations, I was talking about something, more feelings for others, emotional empathy, and so on. And there I think we are starkly limited. I think, I think we are by nature, we will care immensely more about those around us than about strangers, than about non-human animals, than about people in faraway lands and so on. And so for that, I think what, what the way, reason why I don't kill, I wouldn't be in favor of killing somebody in a faraway country, isn't because, oh, I feel, I, I love them as much as I love my son, but rather because I have conceptions of, of the equality of people, of human rights, and so on. And so I think the rights revolution, that sort of thing, does the trick morally in a way that emotional empathy can't. But I want to say, this is sort of a separate topic from the moral imagination, which is more cognitive. Yeah, uh, it was totally separate. I mean, you know, again, that, that, that system of laws you championed didn't spring up automatically. I think it, it evolved as a result of a lot of kind of non-zero contact among different kinds of people, different kinds of cultures, but I'll, I'll get into that more um, next week. Um, in response to the question of, of uh, uh, what, um, you know, how you might institutionally foster moral imagination. I don't know, the technologies could in principle uh, be helpful. Um, you know, this, this Humans of New York thing I think is an amazing phenomenon for those of you who know. It's just this guy in New York who started going around taking pictures of people in New York, called it Humans of New York, and he does such a great job of, of like humanizing people who are in very different circumstances from yours. You know, you, you, he takes a picture, he shares a quote from them, and you just go, y y well, you, you have any number of reactions, they're generally positive. And he's made trips abroad to Iran and so on, and has gone, you know, crossed national lines. A lot of that kind of, you know, I mean, who knows? Uh, you can also imagine trying to introduce this um, into the curriculum. Um, Philip, since you're, you're right there, um, and there's somebody with a question right there. Um, Thank you. Uh, my question is, to the moral imagination, is there, in your thinking about this, anything that you would call perhaps an evil imagination? Um, and I'm asking <coughs> this with an example perhaps in mind, since ISIS has been you know, brought up several times. I watched um, <clears throat> with some curiosity and horror, but also curiosity, the destruction of Palmyra mm -hmm. over the year. And it was hard to watch it and not feel that there was a very deep pleasure that was involved in this level of destruction and the exhibitionism that was involved in it and the whole holding the world at sort of, you know, mm. almost a palpable tension 
in which pleasure was being derived on that end and horror and terror on our end, and it feels without going to the extent of calling it evil by entity, it feels palpable and imaginative in its destruction. Do you, how do you think towards that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I disapprove. It's, it's a common thing. I mean, um, Americans read about people killed in drone strikes and feel good just because they tell us these are people who deserve to die and we don't really know. And, uh, you know, the American response to the bombing of Hiroshima, I think, was, was probably disturbingly um, favorable. I, I mean, you know, this is, this is uh, what I would like to avoid in the world. I mean, um, you can, you know, call it you, you, you can call that evil if you want in, in, in your terms. I mean, again, I'm, uh, I'm arguing that you could just, you could avoid a certain number of these things if you consistently were better at understanding what's motivating the people whose behavior you would like to modify. Um, Sean, do you want to, uh, uh, in, in the front row, and then, um, and then after this, maybe we should take several in a row and, um, just several, uh, we'll respond to John's and then take several in a row um, without response and then we can both say what we want in response to them. A wonderful talk and response, um, as always. I have a, I'm wondering if there isn't between the two of you a kind of classical argument happening between the relative priority of knowledge and will. Um, with you coming down hard on, on knowledge, and Paul making an argument that, you know, you can know a lot of things and still will badly. And I think something like that might be going on here. I mean, I remember many years ago I was reading Woody Allen, and uh, there was this little narrative he wrote in which uh, one guy says to the other, uh, did you hear, did you hear that Socrates got mugged behind the uh, Acropolis the other day? And the guy said, no, no, what happened? Well, two youths came up to him, and they were about to mug him, and Socrates explained to them, that you know, evil was merely uh, an absence of knowledge of the good. <laughs> and, and then what happened? Well, well, they punched him in the nose. Yeah. You know, uh, and it was it was hilarious because it was clear that the knowledge argument wasn't going to do anything about rectifying the will. Right. The will not to injure, even if you know that what you're about to do is is is. So you've been emphasizing the sort of cognitive work of cultivating empathy, and Paul keeps saying. Look, lots of people who are very smart at doing that right. don't actually will the good. Right. And you know, this, of course, was Augustine's argument that the root of, right. uh, of, of, of evil is not so much cognition, but a distorted will. Mm -hmm. um, and willing the wrong thing, even when one knows what the right thing to do is. So I'm wondering if you couldn't make the same argument, even from Buddhist resources, that, that cognitive empathy, unguided by a fundamental orientation of compassion is just not going to be sufficient. Uh, I, I, think, I think that part is true. Uh, again, psychopaths uh, with, with moral imagination can do more harm than psychopaths without. But um, what I should maybe emphasize more is how much I mean to focus on non-zero sum problems. By definition, uh, these are problems where both parties could come out better if they worked things out. So, uh, for example, in Syria, hasn't worked out for us, hasn't worked out for Bashar Assad, you know, hasn't worked out for the, 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 the neighbors who originally um, uh, mounted the, uh, kind of started the proxy war with him uh, during the, the Syrian insurrection, started arming the rebels who are now like, flooded with refugees and face a greater threat of terrorism themselves and so on. It hasn't worked out for anybody. So that's a, that's a case where, and I'm, I'm not sure you could have averted that. I have some ideas, but, but that's in a case where it was just in the interest of all the major players to avoid what happened. Okay, so in a non-zero-sum problem, you're just appealing to self-interest, to just rational self-interest on all sides. So, you know, whereas the guys who punched Socrates, it was a zero-sum situation. If they could get away with the crime, that was a zero-sum situation. So it wasn't in their self-interest to refrain from committing the crime. But if you look around at the world at all the non-zero-sum games that do not get played 
to a win-win solution, if you could just solve that problem, I think that would be transformative. So the question of will, again, this is why I'm not emphasizing emotional empathy. I'm saying cognitive empathy combined with simple self-interest, which is something we can generally assume on, on the part of people, can often solve major problems and avert tragedies. And I hear Paul saying that won't do it because self-will is the core of the problem. Because even if you know uh, that there might be some element of self-interest here, you're not necessarily going to act on it because I think there's even a kind of temptation to, to want, perhaps, w a win that results in a loss to the other. So there's, so there's two sorts of weakness of will issues. One is you may not care about other people. Um, for for zero-sum games, that would come out Socrates' right. is muggers. Right. Um, and if you don't care about other people, increasing your moral imagination, I worry, might do more harm than, than good. But then there's another type, which is, suppose you are on a non-zero-sum game, you might have a sadistic will and want others to suffer, or you, may be, you, have, you might have a greediness, which is you're unwilling to, oh. to wait out the long-term goal and go on to have a short-term goal. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the sadism would have to it would have to be sadomasochism, right? Because, because yes. you're, you're saying they would want to inflict pain even if it was not in their, own obje in their own interest to do it. Well, yeah, I don't have a cure for sadomasochism. That's true. <laughs> I, I, we'll we'll so, discuss it later. So, so Philip, will you just, will you just uh, choose, hand the microphone to, to like three people in a row uh, and, and we'll, we'll uh, write down what they say. Please, everybody, uh, be as brief as possible yeah, at this I'll, point. No I'll statements. i about one or a minute or so. Um, the question's about uh, compiling and, and collaborating research on empathy and, and, and a way to humanize one another and understand each other, along with the, the actual project of getting people to talk to each other across moral and tribal lines, specifically on issues that seem to be dominated or monopolized by ideology and polarization between the right and the left. So it's just two examples. Uh, the Black Lives Matter and police, that, that's one immensely important area where science has taken a back seat. Um, the issue of uh, student activists on campus, Muslims and communities, these, these are issues where science tends to be subject to kind of a, a conversational apartheid where ideology and dogma and, and polarization dominates the conversation and science sort of sits in the back and I think there, so I guess the question is, is, is there, and there is a lot of people talking about this project to make this happen even here in New York, is this something people are talking about where the rubber, where the high level research and the books and the explanations of this kind of moral empathy and understanding at the high level then can meet, you know, where the rubber can meet the road on the ground and actually engineer these conversations on the ground level? And then no, no long answer needed, but I mean, in short, is that, is that something that people have ever been uh, talking about? And would that be something that could conceivably be possible through campuses as well as through relationship building with communities, police, things like that? So. That's all. Yeah, so I think there's, there's a bit of a disconnect between what you're discussing and what a lot of the people in the audience have been discussing. I think your concern is sociological, and a lot of people are bringing up individual examples, like a psychopath would be a, an individual example. So I think what, what you're discussing is a group of people, um, ideological group or nation state and its citizens extending moral empathy to other people. And I can't help but think of Freud and the concept of um, projection. And that essentially the reason why it is, not the reason, but a potential reason why it's so overwhelmingly difficult to extend moral imagination to a group of people you find to be diametrically opposed to you ideologically, even if it's not a zero sum game, is because you need a group of people to act as a scapegoat to pin some type of um, negative impulse, negative belief you have on that other person. When I was an undergrad, and I was strictly more liberal person, I found myself engaging in moral imagination. I was particularly concerned with the question of why conservatives hated gay marriage so much. And I found that um, it's kind of this discursive um, performance that liberals give. They say, oh, I don't understand conservatives, I don't understand conservatives, to the point that if you even simply attempt to understand someone who believes something differently than you, then it becomes, you, you become suspect. You know, as mm. you say, that explanation yeah. becomes conflated with um, excusing them. So I can't help but think of projection as a potential explanation for why people refuse to extend moral imagination. 
Um, very briefly, just to add on uh, some points that other people have raised. Originally, you did start out talking, uh, you, Robert, about what is the root of all, all badness, right? What is the root of human evil? And because there's supposed to be a spirituality element to that. Um, and I wanted to ask whether or not you, you think maybe now that some of what you pointed out, this failure of moral imagination, is due to the fact that, of course, you're, you're weird and most of us here are weird, white, industrialized, educated, rich, and democratic, right? And um, this, this, David Foster Wallace, for example, in This Is Water, makes a very similar point where he says the failure of moral imagination is a great tragedy of kind of Western civilization, but he's talking about what goes on in a shopping line. You're talking about global geopolitics and kind of the spiritual root, and I want to ask you whether or not if you use this moral imagination, would you think that someone, say, who was tortured to death in Saddam Hussein's acid pits would have a very different conception of what evil is than you do, and someone who was in Auschwitz might have a very different conception. And because we've never experienced that, but we have experienced these daily failures of moral imagination, we place so much weight on that as a moral truth rather than maybe something that's actually there. Um. Okay. Um. Okay, this, I guess, okay, if you're both quick, we could, we could do both of these and, and um, like, really pithy. Yeah, I was just wondering if you had any examples of people who have seriously lost out or been disadvantaged because they had too much moral imagination or cognitive imagination. Just an example of someone who's been a loser because of that. All right, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to kind of ask about the, particularly Paul, what he thought the um, value of or imagination of reason was in, in this kind of, as opposed to empathy or, you know, a uh, tremendous capacity to reason as a species, as a way to uh, combat, I, know I was reminded of um, Jonathan Glover's wonderful book, uh, Humanity, A Moral History of the 20th Century, but I won't, I won't go into that. But he had a perfect examples like the ma massacre of Mylai or Melee.